We're going to be talking about physical and chemical properties of seawater. Um, these properties are very important for ocean dynamics, particularly regarding ocean currents and um, the biological processes that take place at different depths in the oceans. So it's, it's also a, a very good uh, beginning to the physical and chemical oceanography part of our uh, course. So we're going to be um, talking about uh, first the physical states of water. And this is a, a very uh, introductory material. I'm sure that you already heard about this in different classes that you took in your high school years. And we're going to talk about the heat capacity of water. And we're going to uh, look into density changes in ocean water because of pressure, temperature, and salt um, changes uh, in seawater. And we're going to look at um, what uh, materials um, basically make up the salt content of seawater. And then we're going to look at the um, carbon dioxide pathways through the Earth's surface, carbon cycle. And the last thing I like to get into is uh, basically pH of seawater and ocean acidification. Very important topics that are extremely timely nowadays because of the... Um, global warming and increasing uh, acidification of ocean waters around the globe. So we're going to first look at um, the state of uh, three states of water. As you well know, water exists um, as one of the most unique um, um, materials on the, um, on the planet Earth. It occurs basically as a solid liquid and gas um, uh, state and um, uh, as you know the solid ice um, basically takes um, time to form from uh, liquid water and also it takes time for the ice to melt so if you um, add 80 calories of heat into a system where ice is um, existing um, you're gonna start um, but melting that ice and um, the ice basically will be transformed into its liquid phase. And if you add more heat into the system, add 100 calories or um, heat up that liquid water up to 100 degrees Celsius, you're going to end up with basically going into the gas phase represented by water vapor. So. Um, basically, it takes an uh, enormous amount of energy and heat to change uh, the states of water from solid to uh, liquid and to, to gas. And um, water is also very unique in the sense that it has uh, a specific bond. We call that hydrogen, hydrogen bonding, and we're going to talk about that very shortly. It's a very strong bond system. Um, as you can see in this diagram here, uh, in liquid water, the hydrogen atoms uh, of one water mole molecule um, also attracted to the oxygen atom of a nearby uh, water uh, molecule. So you see here there are basically um, three water molecules and the hydrogen um, atoms are shared by these three water uh, molecules. So it takes um, it takes enormous enormous amount of energy to break these hydrogen bonds, and that's why we have the um, the concept of latent heat of fusion. Um, that is the uh, amount of heat required to change from solid to liquid, um, and that's eighty calories. And we also have latent heat of vaporization, that is the amount of energy required to convert liquid water into uh, water um, vapor. So this unique uh, bond structure of the water molecule uh, basically also makes water um, uh, a very unique material with very high heat capacity. Um, the high heat capacity comes from the fact that uh, it takes uh, lots of energy to break the hydrogen bonds in a molecule of water. Um, 
because the majority of heat energy is concentrated on breaking the hydrogen bonds, uh, the water molecule itself heats up after the bonds are broken. So that's an um, exothermic, uh, basically, reaction. Um, and as it takes so much energy to break the hydrogen bonds in a water molecule, it also takes significant amount of energy to reform uh, the water molecule afterwards. So um, only when the water molecule achieves a low enough temperature to allow the hydrogen bonds to reform, uh, the water molecule release the, the heat energy. This process of warming and cooling basically explains why water heats up and cools down very slowly. And because of this high heat capacity of the water, the oceans usually warm up very slowly um, in the spring and until the early uh, summer. And But then as the continents cool down very fast, the oceans basically cool down very slowly all the way to late December and early January. So let's take a look at water density and um, what really uh, properties uh, affect uh, water density in the ocean water. So we're looking at, uh, on this diagram, a density versus temperature diagram. Uh, density is given in terms of gram per uh, cubic meter uh, increasing upwards in this direction all the way to 1. And the temperatures are increasing from the left to right uh, from minus 8 to uh, plus uh, 10. And uh, um, as you can see here, we have on the left-hand side of this vertical solid line, we have the ice with um, uh, first high densities. And then in with increasing temperatures from left to right, you see the density is ever slightly is decreasing. And if you look at the right side of this line, you realize that the water densities basically increase with increasing um, temperatures for a while. But then afterwards, uh, once we reach the maximum um, temperature of 3.98 degrees Celsius and the maximum density of 1, uh, the water density basically is decreasing with rising temperatures. So uh, what affects water density? First, the, the pressure. Uh, water is nearly incompressible. So uh, you can't really compress water. Very, very, very slightly you can compress uh, water with increasing depth and increasing pressures. So um, that increased pressure with depth uh, is very important. Uh, because it increases the density of water. Um, temperatures are very important for um, density profiles of ocean water. Uh, so density in general decreases with increasing temperature and the density of ice uh, is um, close to 0.91 and it decreases with increasing temperatures as you can see on this profile, on this um, uh, diagram. Uh, salt is very important and with increasing salt content the salinity increases and but the density uh, also increases with um, increasing salt content. So combined effect of temperature and salinity um, need the freezing point. Those are very important um, concepts that we'll get into. Uh, effect of salt on water. So we're looking at the diagram here uh, on the left hand side uh, showing temperatures in terms of degrees Celsius on the vertical uh, uh, axis of the diagram uh, increasing from the bottom minus 3 degrees Celsius all the way up to 5 degrees Celsius on the uh, horizontal axis we have salinity in terms of gram per kilo um, increasing from left to right. So fresh water has its maximum density at about uh, 4 degree um, Celsius. And so you're looking at um, maximum density there. And uh, But the presence of salt in seawater changes this density uh, profile. 
Well, the freezing point of fresh water is uh, zero degrees Celsius. The salt forces the freezing point of seawater to be much lower. So this yellow line is the line of maximum density. And you can see that with increasing um, temperatures, um, the, the, uh, the salinity is going up. And the freezing point curve here, the thick blue line, as you can see, basically uh, salinity is increasing towards the right, and as the temperatures are also increasing. Typically, seawater with a salinity or salt content of 35 parts per thousand, or you can call that 3.5 percent. Um, will have a freezing point of about 1.8 degrees Celsius. So you're looking at basically um, salt content of um, 35 um, parts per thousand and the corresponding temperature is minus 1.8 degree uh, Celsius. The point of maximum density of seawater also decreases with increasing salinity. Uh, but at a faster rate than the freezing temperature does. So for salt water with salinity about 24.7 parts per thousand, which is just about right there, the temperature of maximum density is uh, below the freezing temperature, as you can see um, right here on the left-hand side. So the majority of seawater has salinity above 24.7, uh, meaning that the seawater cooled from, uh, from the top due to uh, atmospheric temperatures. It continues to cause convection right down to the freezing point. So the sea ice does not form because of that in a uniform way like freshwater ice. Uh, it basically forms ice in very irregular patches. And um, when the ocean water starts to freeze from the top because of um, very low atmospheric temperatures, particularly in the winter time near the polar regions, ice initially takes the form of lots of little crystal disks. Uh, we call them frazal. And these frazals uh, float independently on the sea surface. As more ice crystals grow, um, they form a suspension in the surface water known as the grease ice. And um, this almost looks like oil slick on the face of the on the surface of the ocean water. In calm conditions, these ice crystals can freeze together to form a continuous, uh, basically continuous sheet of um, ice called nilus. And these are initially transparent. Um, ice sheets, small ice sheets. But in more turbulent waters, particularly in the polar regions near the Arctic Circle in the Antarctic, near the Antarctic continent, the waves and wind um, collectively act to compress these tiny frazal crystals into large circular structures, sort of um, concave up, known as pancake ice. So on the upper left hand diagram here, in which you see some pancake ice near the Antarctic continent in the southern uh, pole, near the southern pole. And these pancakes basically float on the surface, colliding with each other and sort of amalgamating together to form uh, what we call ice flows. So these are much larger uh, ice sheets uh, floating around on the surface of the ice, uh, could be sometimes several meters thick. And these are the, um, the flows and ice sheets that uh, polar bears actually like a lot to uh, jump on and take a ride. Uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the density changes also with uh, salinity changes with um, temperature variations. So the, on the left, uh, the lower side, left side of this diagram, we're looking at the density of uh, pure water with no salt. So that's this red curve. Uh, density of pure water with zero salinity uh, initially increases. So if you look at the very left hand side of this um, curve, you see a, a ever slight bump on the surface. 
So that's basically the density increase in terms of salt, dissolved salt content in gram per cubic centimeter. But as you follow this red curve to the right, um, you will realize that with increasing temperatures from left to right, uh, the density of pure water with no salt in it um, decreases steadily. And, um, and so at a maximum density about 4 degree, uh, about 4 degrees Celsius temperatures, the uh, water basically reaches its um, highest density. Now, if we look at seawater with different salt contents, and here uh, you're looking at basically salt content with 20 grams per kilo, shown by the yellow curve, and then the highest salt content and the salinity is represented by this dark blue curve with 35 grams per kilo um, salinity. So the density of seawater increases, um, as you can see, from the orange curve to the dark blue curve with increasing salt content at constant temperatures. And increases with decreasing temperature um, due to the uh, freezing point at constant salt, salt content. So let's take a look at um, some, some characteristic physical properties of water. So we talked about um, physical states of water in terms of gas, liquid, and solid uh, phases. So water is the only substance on the Earth's surface that occurs naturally in these three different uh, states. And as you know, um, this particular property of water is extremely important for the hydrological cycle and um, also very important to transfer heat between the ocean and the atmosphere as water goes from liquid phase into the uh, vapor phase uh, to provide the atmosphere with much needed uh, water molecules. Uh, specific heat of water is one calorie per gram of water per degree Celsius and it is the highest of all common solids and liquids. And because of this specific heat capacity of the Earth, um, basically um, the oceans buffer temperatures on the face of the Earth and, and therefore uh, preventing large changes of surface temperature in the oceans and the atmosphere. So the, the water, ocean water in the equatorial regions is, is not uh, boiling up. Surface tension, uh, water has surface tension and pretty high elastic uh, property of water surface basically provides the surface tension property of water and it is the highest of all common liquids. This is actually very important as we'll see later on uh, because um, this is how insects actually can stand on the surface of water on uh, stagnant uh, lake waters and even rivers and, and so forth. So um, this is a very important uh, property of water in cell physiology and formation of also drops like teardrops. We talked about latent heat of fusion and latent heat of vaporization and so I'll skip that for the moment. And water is um, very, very little uh, compressed. Um, water doesn't um, actually allowed to be compressed, um, so nearly incompressible, and because of that um, density uh, increases with increased uh, pressure going into deeper parts of the of the um, of the oceans. Water is um, extremely important for dissolution in uh, in ocean waters and dissolves all kinds of solids, gases, and liquids. This is particularly important for the salt content of ocean water because, um, as we'll see, much of that salt in ocean waters um, actually is derived from continents. And so the salt comes from continents via rivers and, and um, glaciers and so forth. Um, and Water basically dissolves more substance than any other uh, solvent material on the face of the earth. Um, water is also very unique in the sense that it um, transmits uh, heat energy by conduction, convection, and radiation. So solar energy 
radiation heats up the equatorial ocean waters and um, also uh, water gets uh, cooled via conduction from the top in polar regions so that's very important and affects the density of seawater and also it sets up vertical circulation patterns in the ocean water. Light transparency is also very important. Um, and water, ocean water transmits light energy, particularly in the top 100, 150 meters, we call the photic zone. And um, so all that sunlight coming into the top 150 meters uh, will be um, transferred into uh, photosynthetic um, uh, creatures like uh, phytoplanktons and this process will allow plant life phytoplanktons to do photosynthesis and therefore produce oxygen. Sound transmission um, is very unique to ocean water so ocean water transmits sound waves very effectively and this in turn is very important for echolocation in uh, ocean water by um, different organisms and um, also it's important for us to determine water depth using sonar as we discussed earlier to find out the ocean water depth and or locate different objects like finding on the seafloor the sunken titanic um, by using uh, sonar beams okay um, salinity of seawater is defined by total quantity of dissolved salt in seawater. Um, we have about 48 million trillion kilogram of dissolved salt in the global ocean water, an enormous number. And if all that salt um, gets evaporated from the ocean water, we would get nearly 46 meter thick layer of salt continuous layer of salt covering the entire surf surface of the earth. Um, that shows you how much salt actually ocean water um, contains. And um, so we call that basically the salinity and the salinity of uh, ocean water changes um, from region to region. And that change is affected by three major processes. Uh, evaporation of seawater, particularly due to high solar um, energy um, rates, also precipitation, uh, rainfall, particularly in rainforests and in tropical places, subtropical regions in the, in the oceans, um, highly affected by um, rainfall. Freshwater runoff via rivers, also very important. And of course, freezing uh, and melting of ice caps and ice sheets also very important for density and salinity of uh, ocean water. And this diagram here um, shows basically uh, a sort of flow chart for how the earth, the salt water in the in the oceans um, uh, acquires the uh, the salt content. So volcanic eruptions, for example, uh, produce um, salt into the seawater and um, evaporation uh, from the surface of the ocean water basically uh, increases the salt content in the remaining ocean water, uh, relatively speaking. Um, the precipitation and rainfall, particularly on the continents and mountains, can um, effectively um, cause salt-containing rocks um, in the continents um, to release the salt via chemical erosion and weathering. And that salt is brought back into the oceans by, uh, by rivers. So all these processes really affect the the salinity and the salt content of um, sea water. So that um, salinity um, change uh, in ocean water um, is uh, controlled by 
processes of continuous input of fresh water from rivers, precipitation of rain and snow, and melting of ice, particularly in polar regions or higher uh, latitudes. And um, so because of the fluctuations in uh, temperatures um, based on latitudinal um, changes and um, because of the salinity changes, uh, the density of seawater changes um, latitudinally um, as well. Um, in higher latitudes, like near the Arctic Circle and Greenland and north of the Baltic continent, um, the surface water cools significantly because of the cold atmospheric temperatures and that cold water becomes dense and starts uh, basically sinking. In addition to being cold, uh, extremely cold, <coughs> Um, during the winter times, uh, formation of um, Arctic ice and sea ice um, releases that salt into the seawater because the ice cannot take up the salt into the crystal system and therefore in winter times the ocean surface water becomes relatively uh, unriched in salt contents which increase the density of seawater and that's another reason why seawater basically sinks very rapidly in winter time in polar uh, regions. So uh, the ocean waters uh, store much more heat in the uppermost three meters um, globally than entire atmosphere and this sets up the density circulation patterns uh, in the ocean waters um, globally and these circulation patterns are the most effective um, ways to transfer heat from lower latitudes, particularly equatorial regions, up towards the higher um, latitudes. And we're going to take a look at that later on uh, when we talk about wind belts and conveyor belts. Here you're looking at the diagram uh, a two-dimensional projection of the Earth that shows the global conveyor, ocean conveyor system, or the global ocean conveyor belt. We also call that the thermohaline circulation. And these um, two parts of this word, thermo, relates to uh, temperatures and the second part, halen, relates to salt content of ocean water. So collectively, thermohaline circulation means uh, circulation patterns um, affected by or driven by uh, temperature changes and also salinity changes in, in ocean uh, water. So horizontal differences in temperature and salinity drives the surface ocean currents, um, part of the global conveyor belt system. We're going to be talking about this very shortly. This is the Gulf Stream emanating from the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico, um, traveling to the east and north, and it crosses the uh, Atlantic Ocean and becomes North Atlantic Drift and goes all the way to the north and brings lots of warm weather to the British Isles and then to the Baltic continent, uh, the, all the Nordic countries, and eventually cools off and becomes very dense and sinks. And basically the blue part of this uh, conveyor belt system um, represents the cold deep water which goes back into the uh, equatorial region and off the coast of South America. It um, travels further south and hooks up with the extremely cold um, uh, deep water masses off the coast of Antarctica traveling farther to the to the east. Um, so um, this um, uh, conveyor belt basically is driven by the surface currents uh, first and then the deep cold and uh, very dense uh, deep water masses um, later on. Then, and the surface water um, basically gets replaced by uh, cold and dense uh, 
uh, seawater in places where upwelling takes place and this cold uh, upwelling of um, deep water is extremely important for uh, organisms because it brings uh, nutrients and other uh, important um, elements into the surface uh, water. So thermohaline circulation is an effective heat transport um, in the earth, much more effective than the atmosphere actually. It drives um, warmer surface temperatures um, in the equatorial and subtropical regions towards the polar regions and then um, it, it by doing so uh, uh, moderates the climate in, um, in the oceans. On this um, map we're looking at the Gulf Stream as part of the thermohaline circulation so um, you're looking at basically uh, latitudinal changes on the left hand side and the right hand side of this map and the longitudinal changes going from 90 degree west towards 40 degree west to the eastern Atlantic Ocean and here is the Gulf Stream almost like a meandering river. It starts in the Gulf and exits the Gulf and um, it forms this um, extremely large uh, river system in the um, Western Atlantic Ocean parallel to the coastline of the North American continent and, um, and then it goes towards the north as it does it starts basically deviating from the North American shorelines and starts crossing the Central Atlantic and at that point it becomes North Atlantic Drift and as you can see uh, it starts widening because uh, it starts losing some of its um, latent heat and becomes a much larger um, current as you can see. So um, we have the uh, the Gulf Stream in lower latitudes, very close to the eastern border of the North American shoreline, and then it becomes the North Atlantic Drift, and then it, it splits into two. One arm goes to the, um, to, to the Arctic Circle, and the other arm goes towards the Canary Islands of um, West Africa. And uh, so the surface temperatures in the Gulf Stream can change anywhere from 7 to 20 degrees Celsius. So imagine actually seawater becoming over 20 degrees Celsius in, in warmth. That's a pretty warm seawater and uh, so no wonder actually it carries so much um, heat energy with it all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. You're looking at the um, red colors which indicate extremely warm um, temperatures and the cold blue color basically indicates extremely cold temperatures, particularly in the higher uh, latitudes. So um, the Gulf Stream basically it's um, 100 kilometers wide um, in the widest places. Um, so that's an enormously wide um, river system for you in the oceans and it is about 800 meters or 2600 feet de deep um, going into the ocean so the depth changes between 800 meters to 1200 um, meters so it really sets up an incredibly warm um, waters um, during, in the very top one kilometer of the of the sea floor. Uh, of the uh, of the sea surface, and you will notice that to the north of the Gulf Stream we have clockwise rotating eddies. These are warm eddies, so they um, basically are very important to bring also uh, heat towards the towards the um, towards the Canadian uh, shorelines, and. And they also um, provide um, exchange of heat between land and the the ocean much more effectively. But if you look at the the southern part of the Gulf Stream, there are uh, lots of counterclockwise rotating um, eddies um, operating to the to the south, and, and these eddies are uh, forming 
vortex in the seawater and at times could be quite um, dangerous. So um, the Gulf Stream is one of the most important um, drivers for the formation of most of the cyclones and hurricanes in this region. When we talk about hurricanes later in the semester, we'll get into the Gulf Stream topic again. But the Gulf Stream is basically the dynamo for uh, the, um, the hurricanes brewing up in the lower latitudes and then um, the transport of these um, hurricanes towards, uh, towards the, the land. And, but um, as we'll see later on, the, the Gulf Stream is also extremely important for global climate and global climate change. Um, so we talked about earlier how ocean water uh, salinity is strongly affected by high rates of evaporation and river stream discharge of fresh water from land and also heavy precipitation and rainfall. So let me show you a couple of examples of this, looking at this diagram. And we're looking at the uh, Atlantic Ocean here with the North American and South American continents to the west. And uh, you will see that uh, this, there is a salinity bar here. Very cold colors like dark blue tells you that the salinity and the salt content in these parts of the ocean is extremely low. And the warm colors, particularly um, red, indicates uh, high salinity, therefore high sol salt content. So the North Atlantic uh, is the saltiest anywhere in the global ocean system. And you're looking at extremely high salinity in particularly the central Atlantic Ocean, about um, 35, 40 degree north um, latitude. And we call that part of the Atlantic Ocean uh, a desert, ocean desert. And much like deserts on land, um, here the temperatures are high and also the salinity is high um, because of lots of evaporation, as we will see very shortly. If you look at this part of the uh, Central Atlantic Ocean close to the South American continent, um, you will see that the salinity goes down dramatically, and that's because the Amazon River is basically uh, dumping so much fresh water into the into the ocean. So there is a fresh water uh, plume coming into uh, coming into this um, central West Central Atlantic Ocean, and that that basically low salinity water goes all the way towards the African continent. And if you look at the northwestern part of the South American continent and the, the um, East Central Pacific Ocean, you're going to see very cold colors with so low salinity, and that's because of um, enormous amount of precipitation and rain, heavy rainfall um, right there. And, and so pools of fresh water um, here and lowers the uh, salinity next to the Panama's and Costa Rica's um, coast on the Pacific side. So let's take a look at the salinity changes in the ocean waters. Uh, as we as we just discussed, the salinity of surface water um, changes significantly with latitude. Let's take a look at this diagram. And this is basically a longitudinal profile of seawater in terms of its um, evaporation and shown in blue and precipitation values shown in uh, crimson red. Uh, the red vert vertical line basically represents the equatorial zone. And on the left hand side, we have centimeters per year. Uh, evaporation and our precipitation rates. As we take a walk from the North Pole going to the south uh, with lower latitudes, we're going to cross the equatorial zone and come out of the other side in the southern hemisphere in the and uh, near the Antarctic continent at 80 degrees south latitude. Um, you will realize that along this uh, walk from north to south, the evaporation rates um, go up 
significantly as you approach the um, 40, 50 degree north and south latitudes where the uh, temperatures are relatively cool and we have heavy uh, precipitation and rainfall and therefore um, we have um, basically low air operation rates. But as we go towards the 25 degree north and south latitudes, you see these two peaks by model distribution of evaporation rates on both sides of the equatorial zone and that's because solar radiation is extremely high here and as a result the evaporation rates are very high so these two bumps that you see here correspond to those um, uh, desert belts in the in the oceans where we have high surface salinities. This diagram shows um, the evaporation precipitation difference in centimeters per year shown in blue um, curve versus the salinity. So not surprisingly you will realize that um, these two curves actually really mimic each other and follow each other unlike what we saw here the evaporation and precipitation rate rates in the first diagram sort of had these uh, lagging uh, patterns and they diabolically oppose to each other but here salinity um, basically follows um, high evaporation rates so from north to south as we um, get in close to the equatorial zone um, you realize that the difference between evaporation precipitation um, increases um, towards those 25 degree north and south latitudes where salinity is also extremely high but as you get close to those uh, lower um, latitudes like uh, 5 degree north and south latitude uh, the surface salinities go down dramatically because of high rates of precipitation right um, this map shows the average sea surface salinities uh, in the global ocean system in terms of parts per thousand. Uh, please note that it says summertime, so we're looking at basically these uh, salinity changes in surface ocean waters. And these pinkish lines show same salinity lines. So this is, for example, 35 per thousand isohaline line. Isohaline means same salinity. So as long as you stay on this pink curve here, um, your sea water salinity is about 35 per thousand or 3.5 percent. So um, if you look at this map very carefully you will see that uh, the highest um, salinity surface salinity is shown uh, in um, here in central atlantic 37 per thousand and that is what we call the ocean desert before because of high evaporation rates so um, 37 percent is the highest uh, overall in the global ocean system as you go into those um, landlocked seas like the mediterranean sea or the persian gulf seawater salinities can go up all the way up to 40 42 uh, percent extremely saline waters for example in the mediterranean sea because of high evaporation um, rates but there are also places in the uh, global ocean system where the surface salinities decrease very significantly. So I gave you the example of the Amazon River discharging so much fresh water into the West Central Atlantic Ocean. That's why the salinity goes down to 30 per thousand right there off the coast of um, Brazil. And by the same token, if you look at the very northwestern um, coastline of the North American continent, um, 32 per thousand salinity, and that's because Columbia River and other river systems coming from Canada and Alaska dump so much fresh water that um, the surface salinity 
decreases um, very rapidly. Surface salinity changes in the polar regions um, um, fluctuate quite significantly on a seasonal basis. That's because uh, in winter time and in cold temperatures, in the north, in the northern and southern parts of the ocean systems, um, the surface water starts getting very cold due to extremely lowered atmospheric temperatures. And so the sea ice starts forming. And when sea ice forms, it um, basically leaves the salt behind in the liquid salt water. And therefore, uh, in the wintertime, the surface waters become extremely salty and therefore saline. And so that's one of the reasons um, the uh, polar waters basically sink rapidly in winter time because of their high salinity and high density. But that changes um, uh, quite rapidly actually in the summertime when these uh, polar ice sheets uh, and the polar ice caps start melting and so adding much more fresh waters to the polar regions and therefore decreasing the, the salinity. So let's, let's take a look at where uh, the salt comes from in ocean water. And so ocean water is salty because there is uh, dissolved salt in ocean water. And those uh, salt, different salt types, largely come from the continents via uh, rivers. And, um, and salt basically makes up one of the most important components of uh, seawater. On this table, you're looking at uh, ions listed as major components, uh, salt components of seawater. So some of the most important ones in terms of um, distribution, in terms of gram per kilogram, chloride, sodium, sulfate, magnesium, calcium, and potassium. And these are um, the most significant ions. Most of them are also what we call conservative components like sodium, potassium, uh, bromium, uh, boron, uh, fluor, lithium, rubidium, and cesium. Um, they, we call them conservative because they're not, their distribution um, in ocean water not changed by biogenic processes. On the other hand, we have uh, non-conservative um, components uh, their concentration is altered by biological processes. So phosphate, nitrate, um, dissolved oxygen, carbon dioxide, these are constantly taken up by different organisms in ocean water or oxygen is released due to photosynthesis. So their um, dissolved amount of seawater basically uh, changes because of life in the oceans and that's why we call them non-conservative. Uh, components of uh, seawater. Positive ions uh, come from uh, weathering and erosion on land and negative ions uh, contributed from volcanic eruptions, uh, particularly mid-ocean ridges and subduction zone systems. Um, so this uh, table shows dissolved salts in river water and you will notice if you look at two tables together that um, this uh, salt content in river water is significantly different from um, the salt content in seawater. This is why the um, this river waters are never uh, basically salty, even though we call them salt content, but these are basically very different uh, ions than what uh, seawater has. So these are uh, the least abundant ions in ocean water um, because the rivers basically removed most easily dissolved land salts and carry them down into the oceans to contribute to the salt budget in the ocean waters over the uh, billions of years of Earth history. This block diagram shows um, where the salt all comes from into the seawater. Um, so uh, it's a depiction of natural processes regulating and controlling the salt distribution and so salt water in the oceans. So as we, as I said earlier, the uh, ions like uh, 
magnesium and sulfate um, can come from mid ocean ridge eruptions under seawater, and lots of calcium and potassium also contributed from these uh, mid ocean ridge uh, eruptions. And um, volcanic eruptions on land also contribute lots of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and hydrochloric acid. And most of these ions are um, transferred or transported by atmospheric circulation patterns and precipitation and rainfall down into the into the oceans um, as well. So um, basically, constantly we're adding salt ions into the ocean water by uh, underwater um, eruptions, volcanic eruptions, mid-ocean ridge magnetism, black smokers and organic decay processes taking place in the in the oceans and but at the same time we remove salt ions from seawater uh, because of chemical precipitation which basically take out all these um, ions from seawater and lock them into the sediments on the seafloor or Many organisms um, take up the calcium and, and contribute to the sea budget, sea sediment budget um, as well. Okay, um, uh, let's take a look at the distribution of gases with depth. Um, on the right hand side, we're looking at basically depth in seawater versus oxygen and carbon dioxide distribution in seawater. So, within the top 1200 meters, as you can see, uh, the oxygen is changing, dissolved oxygen amount significantly changing with depth. The top 100, 150 meters of ocean waters called euphotic zone where the solar radiation and solar light penetrates and that's where the phytoplanktons do photosynthesis um, releasing lots of free oxygen into the water so you have a large uh, big peak there in terms of dissolved oxygen amount about uh, more than four four and a half milliliters per liter oxygen and then as you go deep into the water, beneath the 200 meters, once you exit that euphotic zone and the phytoplankton zone, oxygen is um, decreasing quite rapidly um, with depth and um, continues to be um, nearly uh, constant for a while. And, and then about 800 meters at depth, the oxygen water is oxygen amount is is increasing again um, with depth so there's a reason why we see this pattern we explain why we have large peak here this is due to basically respiration of all the organisms within the top of six eight hundred meters of the oceans many mammals many organisms live right here at these depths taking up lots of oxygen respiring and and producing lots of carbon dioxide. So exactly opposite, you see the carbon dioxide, uh, dissolved carbon dioxide amount in ocean water uh, basically increasing rapidly with depth um, against the decreasing oxygen amount. And after 800 meters into the ocean water, you see the steady increase in dissolved oxygen amount. And that's because, as we said before, deep ocean water masses carry lots of dissolved oxygen um, coming from the higher latitudes. So this um, increase in um, dissolved oxygen amount is due to actually the fact that um, um, cold and high pressure and deep ocean water masses carry lots of dissolved oxygen. Um, so um, so we have an oxygen minimum zone um, right there, um, and we have the uh, compensation depth in ocean water, the depth at which the rate of photosynthesis in the photic zone balances the rate of respiration. So we have the uh, compensation depth 
and as you go deeper into the oxygen minimum zone, um, you are getting into what we call the anoxic zone. And uh, so in anoxic zone, we have anaerobic bacteria um, thriving in, this, in these conditions. And we'll get into that later on when we uh, talk about um, life in the oceans and biological oceanography. If surface waters have 150% and more um, dissolved oxygen, we call that uh, supersaturated water in terms of supersaturated uh, in terms of oxygen dissolved oxygen amount. This diagram shows major carbon dioxide pathways through a surface. So we talked about hydrological cycle before. We talked about um, the rock cycle. So here is the carbon dioxide cycle, and all the numbers that you see on this diagram in different colors given in billions of metric tons. So keep that unit in mind as we look at these numbers in these boxes and also on the flow chart. So um, carbon dioxide um, is a very important gas in the, in the atmosphere in global warming that um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing as you know. So oceans basically uptake all that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and that carbon dioxide is used by marine organisms and converted into oxygen, as we discussed uh, earlier. But uh, how much carbon dioxide can ocean water take in? It depends on several important factors uh, or properties. We talked about um, the temperature and salinity changes in ocean water. And so that's very important for uh, dissolving carbon dioxide in the ocean water. Also the pH, the acidicity of ocean water is very important for carbon dioxide um, uptake. So that transfer of carbon, atmospheric carbon dioxide into the ocean and particularly ocean depths is what we call biological pump, um, transferring carbon from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to organic molecules due to photosynthesis and that carbon is eventually locked into uh, sediments, uh, we call them um, carbonate sediments or calcareous sediments, permanently locked into uh, ocean floor in terms of um, uh, carbonate deposition. So as a result, this carbon dioxide uh, cycle uh, in the in the earth is extremely important um, because one of them and the most effective way of taking away carbon and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and putting it away in the in the deep oceans. Um, so the green numbers here um, refer to total amount of carbon dioxide stored in different containers, if you will, or different reservoirs. The atmosphere has 750 billion uh, billions of metric tons, uh, and um, the, you see that this, that number is even much, much bigger in soil and detritus on the land surface. Fossil fuels, of course, contain lots of carbon dioxide, and therefore, when we burn them, we're releasing that carbon and carbon dioxide back into the earth. A very terrible thing for the, for the global uh, warming. And um, the numbers in parentheses that you see, um, like here in surface ocean or in the atmosphere, um, refer to net, net annual changes in the total amount stored in these different um, reservoirs. Um, so the oxygen balance is part of this carbon dioxide cycle. Um, in the top parts of the oceans, we do photosynthesis, uh, creating lots of oxygen. And But deeper in the oceans, uh, respiration and decay of organic material consume lots of um, oxygen. And... Um, Weathering and oxidation on land also consume lots of oxygen and release uh, carbon dioxide in return. But 
Thanks to the photosynthetic processes by those phytoplanktons uh, in the top 100, 150 meters of the oceans, we generate nearly 300 million metric tons of excess oxygen on the Earth. So that's uh, basically very essential for life in the, in the oceans. Um, let's take a look at the acidity of seawater. Uh, which we call pH. So in general, the pH of surface water is slightly higher, so alkaline in nature, about 8.2. And warm and high pH water um, generate carbon, carbonate ions and production of calcium carbonate in seawater. So this is one way of getting um, basically a, um, large amounts of calcium carbonate uh, in uh, dissolved in um, tropical waters like Bahamas, Key West, Everglades, and so forth. And this is why at these latitudes, uh, lots of organisms basically take up that calcium carbonate uh, in the seawater and make up their shells. And so. The fact that um, in warm ocean water temperatures you have organisms um, with calcium carbonate shells is basically a part of this um, uh, acidity of seawater concept. And deep in cold ocean water, on the other hand, carbon dioxide, the dissolved carbon dioxide concentration is very high and that lowers the pH. Um, and um, Therefore, the water basically becomes much more uh, acidic with increased uh, carbonic acid in, um, in seawater. And as the uh, carbon dioxide concentration goes high and the pH becomes lower, basically calcium carbonate gets totally dissolved and cannot be taken in by uh, organisms to make up their shells. This is why in higher latitudes and polar regions we don't have any organisms living there with shells made of um, calcium carbonate. So we have basically organisms living in their uh, silica-made shells like diatoms and radiolarians um, because of the fact that uh, those uh, polar ocean waters are extremely acidic. So carbon dioxide in ocean water acts as a buffer that prevents large changes in pH. If that were not the case, the ocean water acidicity can fluctuate very rapidly and short distances, making the life in the oceans extremely tough for those uh, organisms living in shells made of um, calcium carbonate or other material. And... Um, so the pH level and the carbon dioxide level um, affected strongly by the atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide amount and how much of it is basically pumped into the surface waters in the oceans and how much uh, respiration marine organisms do in, in what depths and also oxidation of organic matter. Uh, we call that uh, decaying process in ocean water. Um, the average pH of oceans... Uh, uh, fell down um, over the years, particularly since the Industrial Revolution in the 1860s. And the predictions uh, show that the average pH in the oceans may fall down by 0.5 units by uh, 2100. So that's about 80 years from now. If the global carbon dioxide emission rates uh, increase or in fact stay at the same rate, um, this is what's going to happen, that in about 70, 80 years, um, the seawater will become even so, uh, more acidic. And, and as a result, the life in the oceans may change dramatically as we know it. But the good thing is that the ocean is a net source of oxygen to the atmosphere. And we're going to be talking about biological process and processes in ocean waters 
uh, very important for biological oceanography as well as for chemical oceanography and taking up carbon dioxide and pumping it down into the into the deep ocean. So the last thing I want to talk about today is ocean acidification. Um, this is the ongoing decrease in the pH of the Earth's oceans, a major concern for scientists uh, as well as social, social scientists and policy makers because increased carbon dioxide dissolution uh, in the oceans due to increased uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide really increasing uh, the rate of ocean acidification at unusually high rates. And um, so nearly about 30-40% of carbon dioxide uh, released in the atmosphere comes from human um, activities. And, um, and when uh, basically uh, carbon dioxide is, is uh, introduced to ocean water in excessive amounts, um, it forms carbonic acid um, and H2SO3, and that basically reacts with water molecule to produce a bicarbonate ion and a hydronium. And collectively, the increased bicarbonate and hydronium in seawater increase the ocean acidity. So look at this number. From 1751 to 1994, surface ocean pHs uh, estimated to have decreased from approximately 8.25 to 8.14. So those um, two digital points to the right of the, the number 8 is enormous change, uh, representing almost increase of almost 30% in uh, hydronium ion concentration in the world's uh, ocean system. And what does that do? Um, basically, that increased uh, acidicity in ocean water really harms marine organisms by depressing um, their metabolic rates and weakening their immune responses and also causing coral bleaching. This is one of the reasons why coral reefs in a global ocean system are in big trouble nowadays because the ocean waters are becoming progressively much more acidic. And so... Um, this is something that we all have to be very concerned about uh, the net increase in amount of carbonate uh, and carbon dioxide in ocean waters. So I, I'm providing you with here these, uh, these images most recently uh, produced by scientists in uh, several different oceanographic institutions here in the United States. And um, the top, the, the, the lower smaller thumbnail diagrams show basically changes in temperature, uh, dissolved oxygen levels, acidity and productivity and by, uh, by the year 2100. So um, you're looking at basically scale changing from 0 to 1, 1 being the highest change per unit in ocean waters. And temperature-wise, you'll realize that higher latitudes in the northern hemisphere will become extremely, extremely high, which is extremely bad because that means that we will not have any uh, ice caps basically in the northern, um, northern near the northern pole. Dissolved oxygen levels, um, the changes are very very important also in near the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere or the northern pole and the southern pole acidicity of seawater is going to be incredibly changed look at the rate of change uniformly red meaning uh, significant changes in all ocean waters so the ocean waters will become much more um, acidic and productivity um, also changes a lot in ocean water, again, across the equatorial oceans, particularly in the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, as you can see, and high polar regions. Uh, productivity in terms of organisms uh, and their existence will, will be changed dramatically. This larger map shows the combination of all these thumbnails together and reflects basically 
the significance of changes and how they fluctuate from nearly no change to very high changes. And again, you see the major changes in the uh, equatorial zones, um, in the oceans, and also um, beyond the mid to high latitudes, particularly in the northern hemisphere. So what that means is that uh, by 2100s, uh, the local composition and chemical composition of seawater uh, will be so much more different and so acidic that in those extremely warm and acidic waters, many phytoplankton species will either die out and or move towards uh, cooler regions in the ocean waters. Um, that means that um, as phytoplanktons migrate significantly, so will the other organisms in the trophic uh, levels of the food web. And therefore, um, all the fish that we enjoy um, catching and eating off the coast of um, North America basically will be displaced towards higher latitudes and that will be a major problem for the fishing industry in North America, particularly in the, uh, in the United States. So marine communities may look very different in the next century because of um, significantly raised temperatures in ocean water and significantly uh, raised uh, um, pH, uh, raised acidicity in, in seawater. Okay, that makes the, um, the end of this uh, lecture for now, and 